All right. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about the Mongols today. Um, so we'll be talking about the rise of the Mongol Empire starting around 1200. That should be a key date that you have in your head. You might have noticed that I'm not huge on date memorization, but 1200 is one of the key turning points in this class. In fact, the official AP test starts in the year 1200. And the reason they picked that date is that is when the Mongols conquer China and the Middle East and Russia and then later northern India and wreck Europe and unite all of these major civilizations together and bring about a new phase of kind of trans-Eurasian interaction. It's one big step towards integrating the entire world into a single global system. The next big step happens, anybody want to guess? America. The Americas. When does that happen? Yeah, 1492. Or if you want to round up a little bit, just to have nice even numbers, 1500. So the course is kind of organized in chunks of more and more globalization. So before 1200, we did have interactions between different parts of the world. China and the Middle East and India were all linked using the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean trade route. Um, but the Mongols are going to take all of these different regions and actually put them together into a single empire for like 50 years, then it's going to fall apart. Because Mongols are way better at conquering than they are at ruling. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on here. And this unit that we'll be looking at is going to be focusing on the Mongol conquests and then on the land-based empires that come after the Mongols. So we'll be looking at the Ottoman Empire, the sort of Neo-Persian Empire, um, the Mughal Empire in India, and the Ming Dynasty in China. Oh, and Russia. Cool. So that's what we'll be doing. Now, let's talk about the Mongols and why they're so awesome. So, the main reason that the Mongols are awesome is they are pastoral nomads in the spot that is basically pastoral nomad heaven. If you were a herder and you had to imagine a place that would be the best possible place to be a herder, the endless grasslands of the Eurasian steppe are the place that you would envision in your mind. They're kind of cold and they're kind of dry, but they are like 5,000 miles of grassland that stretch all the way from the Ukraine in Europe to Korea in East Asia. It is essentially an endless, infinite sea of grass. Now, it is too dry to farm, which might seem like a bad thing. But if you are a pastoral nomad, that is actually awesome. Why? Yeah? Because not all of the, like, if there was like a way to farm, they would just stay there, right? Yeah, if there was a way to farm, pastoral nomadism would not be the dominant strategy. If there was a way to farm there, farming civilizations would move in, build walls, irrigate the fields, and shoot at you with bows and arrows until you left. So the fact that it's pretty dry and pretty cold actually makes it better for pastoral nomads because they can survive by essentially turning grass into food with their massive herds of sheep and goats and cows and shaggy cute little ponies. The Mongol horses the most feared cavalry in the entire history of the world were cute little tiny shaggy ponies. They were tough, they could live on just like dried grass, and they could be totally comfortable in like sub-zero temperatures. So, uh, this is a typical Mongol village. Um, these tents here are called yurts. They're really not that different than like teepees. They're just uh, tents made out of skin, mostly, also like wool from the sheep. Um, 
And uh, it's really relatively easy to break these yurts down, load them up on wagons, and just move on. Um, so as pastoralists, one of the defining elements of their society was that they were hard to organize into large hierarchical structures. Um, farmers are easy to conquer and dominate. Why are farmers easy to conquer and dominate? The main reason is that you always know where the farmers are. Where are the farmers? In their field. Yeah, they're next to the food that they're growing. So as long as you know where the field is, you know where the farmers are. Now, pastoralists are not like that. Pastoralists are very hard to control and very hard to tax and organize because they can just leave. So um, if you wanted to be king of the nomads, you would not have any idea where your people were, how many people you ruled, or how much tax revenue you'd be getting in that year. Herding herders is like herding cats. Their mobility makes it very, very difficult to organize them. So the normal state of affairs in Mongolia and the Eurasian steppe, which includes other nomadic ethnic groups too, like Turks and Uyghurs and Jurchens and the Xiongnu and the Huns, but they're all basically doing the same thing. Uh, the basic state of affairs is yeah. warfare between small family units, or maybe, at most, extended kinship networks called clans, or maybe sometimes called tribes. It's essentially anarchy with family groups fighting against each other for control of the best spot, and sometimes also attacking each other to steal their cows and women. Now, you might remember that in pastoral societies, women had higher status and greater freedom. And they definitely did. But it is also a sad fact that one of the main reasons that pastoral groups attacked each other was to acquire wives. Yeah. So less sexist than Song China, but still pretty bad. One reason that we know this is that this was the case for Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan's family unit, which he was the leader of, was attacked when he was a young man, and he lost almost everything. He lost most of his stuff, most of his herd, and his young wife that he had just married. Um, so uh, he then went off to live by himself with like, his grandma and his close like relatives as a hunter-gatherer living up and down a river system in Mongolia but he swore that he would get it all back. And he did, and then he just kept going. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So, the key for building a powerful state is somehow getting the pastoralists to want to work with you. You can't make them work with you, because they could literally just leave at any point. So how are you gonna get all of these millions of herders scattered out across 5,000 miles of endless step to work together? That is the question that Genghis Khan is going to solve. And when he solves that, he is going to find himself in control of the most terrifying military force of the time period, and potentially one of the most terrifying military forces to ever have existed ever in the world. Up there with like the Roman army, the Macedonian phalanx, and maybe, I don't know, like the Nazi Blitzkrieg. So, um, how were these small family groups structured? Each clan had a leader, and that leader was known as a Khan. It basically is just like a chief of that clan or tribe. Um, within that tribe, uh, they would carry on uh, small, locally organized religious practices that were essentially still animist. That is, they were not hierarchical, organized religions. Um, they were not supposed to be spread. And most people worshipped the natural features of the environment that they lived in. They believed that rivers and mountains and the sky 
had a spirit, an animating spirit. For example, Genghis Khan believed that the most sacred spot in the whole world was a mountain back in Mongolia near where he was born. And he worshipped that mountain. Um, this is going to be important later because it means that the Mongols are going to be 0% interested in spreading religious ideas. And they are going to be totally religiously tolerant. The Mongols assume that people far away are going to worship different things than they do because the Mongols worship stuff back in their home. So, when the Mongols conquer China, they're not like, you have to worship the magic mountain back in Mongolia. They're just like, you are worshiping whatever your stuff is. That's fine. That's cool. Go for it. And this is going to be really helpful for the Mongols because one of the main things that makes people not want to join your empire is telling them that their gods are fake. So, that's going to help them a lot. Um, it was also believed that the Khans, the leaders of these family organizations, had special ability to access the spiritual realm. These Khans were not just military leaders, they were also shamans, so spiritual leaders. And what shamans would do is, among other things, they would access the spiritual realm personally. They would literally go into like a trance often brought on by chanting and music. And, oh wait, go back. Oh yeah, actually cool, that's great. Yeah, here's a con. Um, and they would commune with the spirit world. That is, have a bunch of weird ideas while chanting for like hours at a time and then come back and tell everybody what they saw. So, uh, Genghis Khan, who we're going to talk about, was believed not only to be an invincible general, but was also believed to be the most powerful shaman in the entire Mongol tradition. Oh, also, one quick note. I think this is on one of the slides. But the tradition of shamanism, you don't need to go back to there. The tradition of shamanism practiced by the Mongols is known as Tengrism. This is not really a Mongol concept. The Mongols just called it what we do. But Western scholars have called the particular type of shamanism practiced by the Mongols that focuses on worship of local natural places, they call it Tengrism. So the Mongols are unique in many, many ways. Uh, they're one of the only major empires founded by pastoralists. They're also one of the only major empires without an organized religion. Tengrism is just a very open, basic form of animism, where basically anybody can engage with the spirit world. Um, OK, cool. So this is a painting of Genghis Khan. Doesn't, we actually have very little idea of what Genghis Khan looks like. There's tons and tons and tons of pictures of him, but they all look pretty different. So. Genghis Khan was a god. Um, there's tons of legends told about his birth. Um, like most great conquerors, people say that when he was born, there were like various omens and signs that he was going to be a great warrior, probably made up afterwards. He was originally known as Temujin, um, and he had a really rough life. As soon as he became Khan, his little family group, he was attacked by a rival. And he lost almost everything. He almost died. He only survived by immediately running away with his followers and leaving behind all of his livestock, all of his belongings, and his wife. But he knew that if he stayed to fight, he'd be killed. So he ran away, and he swore that he would get it all back. He would kill the people who stole his wife, and he would take her back. And he eventually did. After several years of laying low, he was able to link up with a different family, a different clan, and move up in that clan and convince them to go and attack those people that attacked him. He leads the attack, he kills them, he takes back everything that they took from him, including his wife. Also one thing that I think is quite nice is while his wife had been stolen by the other guy, she had had a kid by that other guy, but Genghis Khan just adopts that kid as his own. 
and raises him up to be one of the leading warlords of his empire. Yeah. Later people talk trash and they say he's not even a real heir. Like in his comments, like if you say that again, I'm gonna break your back. Which is actually the main way that the Mongols would execute people. Uh, the Mongols believed that it was the greatest dishonor in the world to bleed. If you bled, it basically meant you were a total loser and everybody hated you. So, an honorable execution would be one that killed you without causing you to bleed. So what they would do is they would basically strap your feet down and then bend you back over a bar of wood until your back snapped in half and then you would die. But you wouldn't bleed. You wouldn't bleed. So it's an Don't honorable you, like, tear Yeah. Or like when they conquered Baghdad, they rolled up the, uh, the leader, uh, the, the caliph of the Abbasid Caliphate in a carpet and trampled him with horses. But he probably did bleed a little bit, but the blood was all soaked up by the carpet, so. Couldn't they just like suffocate them instead? What's up? Couldn't they suffocate them instead? You could suffocate, you could strangle, but if, if you really wanted to dishonor somebody, if like somebody betrayed you, or like dishonored you, you would kill them in a way that caused them to bleed. Uh, in one battle, Genghis Khan was hit by an arrow, and his best friend, um, like, had to like sit there and like stop the bleeding from Genghis Khan's neck for like hours and hours and hours. And then afterwards, Genghis Khan was like, "You better not tell anybody about it." But obviously, he did because I know about it. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think that's interesting that the, the possibly the greatest conqueror and warlord of all time was terrified of bleeding. Um, like, he might have spilled more blood than any other person in the world. And let me just pause for a second and say here at the beginning, the Mongol conquests, while awesome and fun to talk about, are either the first or the second deadliest conflict in human history. It's roughly uh, up there with World War II. Both World War II and the Mongol conquests resulted in about 50 million deaths. However, the Mongol conquest resulted in 50 million deaths when the world population was only about 500 million. So that means that about one in 10 people in the whole world died because of this guy. You know, and the social and economic and cultural forces that made his conquest possible. Because remember, you can't do it by yourself. You've got to be in the, the right place at the right time. What about the Black Death? So the Black Death killed more people than Genghis Khan. But that was an accident. Um, <laughs> but also, the Mongol conquest unified Eurasia and is one of the main reasons that the Black Death was able to spread both to China and Europe. And people believe that it actually originated in Mongolia. There are also reports, which are not verified, that the Mongols would occasionally throw plague-ridden bodies over the walls of cities they were besieging in order to infect these cities. So if that's true, then I think you could count some of the plague deaths as part of Genghis's kill count. Didn't like half the population oh. die, though? What's so, up? Didn't like half the population then die because of Black Death? Yeah, so in Europe, uh, earlier estimates put the, the death toll at around 30% of the population, but more mm -hmm. recent estimates have upped it to about 50% of the whole population of Europe. It was less bad in China and less bad in, in um, other less densely populated areas, but yeah, the, the Black Death is the single most devastating pandemic in world history. <laughs> maybe tied with the great dying of the indigenous population of the Americas after Europeans bring over smallpox, measles, influenza, mumps, malaria, plague. Mm. Yeah. And guns. Oh. Yeah. But so, um, so, Genghis Khan joins up with a clan, takes back his wife and all of his stuff, and after he kills the leaders of that clan, he marries somebody else from that clan, a woman from that clan. And he then offers all of the defeated people a job. 
instead of killing them or stealing all their stuff or dragging them into exile, he says, why don't we make one giant clan? And they do. And from there, Genghis Khan proceeds to go around and to raid and to conquer all of the other Mongol groups and to incorporate them all into a single huge army. And every time he defeats a group, he strategically marries off the women from that tribe to people in his group. And he marries off women from his tribe to people in that group. And this is how he's trying to bind the pastoralists together into a single unit, by essentially trading women as a form of currency and creating a big interlocking web of marriage alliances. Nicole, I see you shaking your head, and I totally understand. It's not nice, but it works. <laughs> because of this fact that Genghis Khan takes new wives every time he wins, Genghis Khan is the single most genetically successful human being on the planet that we know of. Estimates say that somewhere around one-third of all people in Asia can trace their descent back to Genghis Khan. That is kind of awesome. Isn't it crazy? Yeah, so he had like hundreds and hundreds of wives and thousands and thousands of kids. And his kids were mostly very high-ranking and successful Mongol people who then went on to have lots of kids of their own. So, yeah, if you are from Asia, you probably have a little tiny slice of Genghis DNA in you. So if you ever have visions of burning villages, or you, in your dreams, see yourself riding across a frosty open field under the moonlight, that's Genghis. <laughs> um, white people, you are less likely to have Genghis Khan DNA because the Mongols never conquered uh, Western Europe. Also, if your family is mostly from Sub-Saharan Africa, same. But anywhere that the Mongols conquered, the odds of you having a little bit of Genghis Khan or other Mongol DNA, super high. Um, so that's cool. Um, also, obviously, if you're mostly like Native American, Indigenous, you know, no Mongol DNA for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless maybe the Mongols did a secret conquest and didn't tell anybody. Uh, okay, so. Now, after conquering all of the different tribes, and it's a long story. Most of Genghis Khan's whole career is just running around Mongolia conquering all the Mongols. That takes a long time. It actually takes longer than conquering the rest of the world. But, not quite, but, you know. Um, he spends most of his career conquering all of the other Mongolian tribes. And after he does that, he declares himself Khan of Khans. He's the Khans Khan. So, um, and he then goes on to focus heavily on organizing the Mongol military. Could you click for me? So uh, here is the conquest that Genghis Khan manages. Um, the little bit of China he doesn't do. This is basically when Genghis dies, and then they keep going from there. But so, that's everything that the Mongols conquer. Mongolia, more Mongolia, Central Asia, oh, Northern China, Middle East, all of China, and Russia. And then it splits. So right after they conquer basically everything, it splits up and they argue and fight over it. Okay, let's keep going. So, let's talk about how the Mongols built the most terrifying military organization of their age. First of all, the Mongols were primarily an army composed of cavalry. A lot of people mispronounce the word cavalry, and it really bothers me because I'm a military history nerd. We won't talk that much about military history because it's less important than cultural and economic and political history. But it's super fun, and there's 10,000 hours of good military history YouTube content out there. But it is not pronounced Calvary or Calvary. Calvary is like where Jesus died on the cross or something. It's pronounced cavalry. Cavalry. But so anyway, the Mongols 
are an almost entirely cavalry-based military, which is super weird. Because most, um, most agrarian empires cannot afford to put every single one of their soldiers on a horse. For an agrarian empire, you can either have horses or people. They both require the same resources. If you want to have more horses, that means you have to devote more land to pasturage. You have to feed these big, heavy war horses grain. So basically, you can have horses, but for every horse that you have, you're giving up like three people. Horses eat a lot. So, for most empires, the Roman Empire, you know, any empire that you think of that's based on farming, you, it's literally impossible to have a massive army of all horses. It would just be too expensive. Uh, in medieval Europe, where they relied on mounted knights, the knights made up a tiny, tiny percentage of the total population, maybe like 2 or 3 percent. But for the Mongols, every single person there raised horses and lived on horseback. They literally couldn't do anything else. That's where they got all their food, all their materials was from raising horses. And so the Mongols had infinite horses. Every single Mongol soldier would go into battle with at least two and sometimes up to five horses. So as they were marching and moving around, they could switch from horse to horse to keep one horse from getting super tired. They would also occasionally uh, be able to march through deserts by drinking their horse's milk and occasionally also drinking their horse's blood. Yeah. So this gave the Mongol army an unprecedented amount of mobility, uh, which means simply that they could move around way faster than any army that they came up against. Because every other army that they came up against was made up mostly of poor little foot soldiers. So the Mongol army could literally just run circles around the people who came up against them. And if you wanted to send out just your cavalry against the Mongols, you'd be outnumbered like 10 to 1. But on the other hand, if you wanted to stay with your guys, you would be so slow that the Mongols could just run around you or wait until the exact right moment to attack you. So the fact that the Mongols were almost entirely mounted gave them a huge, huge advantage. Second, because the entire Mongol civilization was pastoral, they could just bring literally their entire population with them. All of their wives, all of their cattle, all of their sheep, they could relocate their home base, which is another huge advantage. Um, so Genghis Khan, though, basically came up with a large-scale military organization on his own. The Mongols were masters of small-scale, like hit-and-run warfare, maybe like you know 20 on 20 or 50 on 50 battles. But the Mongols were not experienced at all in these sort of larger scale battles that were now going to be necessary. If you want to go up against Russia, or Persia, you're going to be facing armies, of, or, or China, you're going to be facing armies of like 50 or 100,000 people. So how are, you going to, how are you going to do that? So what Genghis Khan did is he organized groups in a decimal system. You would be grouped with 10 other people, and there would be one head guy in charge of the 10. He'd be like your squad leader. And then those 10 people would be grouped into 10 groups of 10 which would be like your regiment, a thousand horses, or a hundred horses. And then you'd have 10 groups of a hundred, which would be higher up, until you got up to the largest unit, which was, could be a hundred thousand if you needed it to be. Um, and so there was a chain of command going down from the largest unit, which Genghis Khan was in charge of, down to little 10 unit squads that trained independently. And each of these squads had their own leader and could operate effectively on their own, or link up into larger groups. This was essentially the same as modern military chains of command. You've got generals in charge of the whole army, and then colonels in charge of like divisions, or you know, regiments or whatever, and then captains in charge of battalions, all the way on down to sergeants in charge of little squads of like seven dudes. Genghis Khan invented that, all on his own. And this gave the general lots of control, but also gave individual mobility to his, his units. So he deserves a lot of credit for coming up with that system. Also, he had a system of collective reward and punishment. 
if your squad, if even one person in your squad ran away, everybody in that squad would be killed. It would be better for you to shoot your squad buddy to keep him from running away than to let him get away. On the other hand, if your squad performed admirably, or if a single person within your squad performed well, everybody would get bonuses, you know, extra wives after the next conquest. Or maybe extra cows. Same, same difference. Just kidding, just kidding. Well, not really. No, no. Well, I mean, of not. I mean, the Mongols thought so, but I was just saying that to make sure you were paying attention. Good job, Tim. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, you two. I was kidding. Um, now, last of all, um, Genghis Khan was really good at adopting good ideas when he saw them. So when he conquered China he gained access to the most advanced technology in the world. And he wasn't interested in a lot of it. He wasn't super interested in printing, but he, or he wasn't super interested in clocks, but he was super interested in gunpowder. And so, after he took over China, he said, all right, so um, everybody who knows how to do gunpowder is coming with me, and we're going to, we're going to the Middle East now. And so he scooped up a bunch of Chinese engineers, put them on the backs of ponies, and brought them with him. And then when he got to the big fortified towns of the Middle East, he had Chinese engineers to build catapults and bombs that he could use to destroy the walls of the cities that he had conquered. Oh, and there's one last thing that made the Mongols super effective. They had a very simple policy for people that they encountered. When they went out and they met somebody, they gave them a choice. And the choice was the same every time. It says, it was, surrender immediately, or we will kill every man. Cows and women. What's up? Cows and women. They get the cows and women. Well, yeah. I mean, why would you kill good women? Hey. I'm speaking from the Mongol perspective. It's a little sus? Guys, come on. I'm a feminist. I'm on your side. I, I definitely do not view women as resources. I promise. I promise. I swear he winked. <laughs> yeah, I winked, but with this eye. Exactly. Okay, so... Um, no, he's good. He's good. Right, so that is a standard Mongol practice. And at first, when these this, this horde of, uh, you know barbarians, quote-unquote, showed up outside the walls of cities, people were like, who are you? You're basically just a bunch of homeless people with ponies. Get out of here. But people didn't make that mistake again. Because when they heard about what happened to one city, the next city would be like, okay. We would be happy to be part of the Mongol Empire. And actually, being part of the Mongol Empire was not terrible. If you resist... All the adult men die, probably and most of the kids too. But on the other hand, if you join, the Mongols will let you keep your religion, they will let you keep your political structure, they will link you up to other cities in the Mongol Empire and protect trade routes, and they will leave. They'll just come back every, every once in a while to collect tax money and then leave again. The Mongols are not interested in living in cities. They think cities are stupid and full of disease. And they're definitely right about the second part. So they show up, they kill who's ever in charge, unless they agree to work with them, and then they just leave them in charge, and they say, we're gonna be back in a year, and you better have like a thousand horses and a bunch of silk ready for us, or we're out of here. Or, I mean, you're done. Right, cool. Any questions about any of that? Okay, uh, what's the next slide here? Oh, this is just um, this is just a family tree. So here's Genghis Khan. These are his kids. Um, uh, yeah, so he had a couple different important grandkids. Um, 
So down here we've got Kublai Khan is one of his important grandkids. He's going to be the first emperor of the Yuan dynasty. Um, another important line is this one. Here's his kid Ogadai and his kid Kyuyuk. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading a letter from Kyuyuk written to the Pope, which I'm very excited for. Kyuyuk is sent off to conquer Russia. And you know how they always say, don't invade Russia in the winter? Yeah. It doesn't apply to the Mongols. Because Mongolia is just as cold and terrible as Russia. Well, not quite, but almost. So the Mongols, they've got nice silk underwear, they've got furs, they've got shaggy little ponies that don't freeze in the winter like German tanks do, and so they're fine. Um, and this was his first kid who he, he actually was probably not his, but he still recognized as his kid and made heir to his empire. Um, okay, um, what's our next slide? Yeah, and so here is a picture of the conquests. Uh, and this also shows the later divisions of the conquest into the different quote unquote hordes, which are just smaller kingdoms. So anyway, uh, I think we have about five minutes left. So we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow when we come in, is why were the Mongols so successful? Um, but there's a lot of reasons. It's probably all of these. Do you want to just hear more about what, like, how amazing the Mongol cavalry was? Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, well, so, the cool thing about being a Mongol horse archer is that basically nobody else could touch you. The standard Mongol military strategy went like this. You'd, if you decided you wanted to fight the other side, yeah, you don't have to write this down. If you decided you wanted to fight the other side, they would line up and face you. And you could ride up to them and shoot arrows at them with your little tiny compound bows made mostly out of bone and glue. The Mongols could fire very accurately while galloping full speed. That is, they could control their horse with just their legs and they could shoot while the horse was between strides. So they would wait till the horse was in the air and they would loose the arrow right at the peak of the stride. Wow. Uh, they still have archery competitions in Mongolia today, which you can watch, um, where people ride and then fire at a target while galloping. Yes, Commissioner? Do they use horse hair for like the, the bow? Ah, the like, string would yeah. probably have been made by, out of tendon. Um, um. Yeah, I don't think hair would have been strong enough because these bows, you know, people, I think it has a lot to do with like, Tolkien and like fantasy games like D and D, they always imagine archers as these like little wafy elf guys. But actually, to be a good war archer, you have to be incredibly strong because these bows are designed to punch through armor. So the bow, it's called the bow's uh, draw, um, and that means how much how much poundage is required to bend the bow. And a war bow will be like at least 80, sometimes 100 or 120 pound draw. Some English longbows, which are essentially small trees, would be like 180 pound draw. So like imagine going to the gym and putting, uh, putting a like, like whatever that machine is on 180 <laughs> and then going, Hah! that would be pulling back the English longbow. But so these Mongol bows are probably like 80 or 100 pound test. So you're like riding a horse and then flexing <laughs> and releasing. And you wouldn't hold it like that because that would wear you out. So you'd just be like <laughs> like that. And so these are just these are little sinewy tough guys who have basically eaten horse jerky and yogurt their entire life <laughs> who can shoot a bird out of the air while riding their horse. This is just beyond what you can imagine skill-wise. And they are an entire army of that. Going up against mostly peasants who were trained how to hold a spear like a month before. 
<laughs> the, it's not fair. Um, we have two minutes. Can I tell you about one battle? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the Mongols eventually make it to Western Europe. Western Europe is ruled by knights. The knights make up like 2% of the population, and they view themselves as elite cavalry warriors. And they fight in super heavy armor on super huge battle steeds, also covered in armor. So when the Mongols show up, the knights get ready, and they have their horde of peasant footmen holding sticks. And the Mongols show up, and they shoot a bunch of arrows, and kill a bunch of people, and then run away. And the knights say, ha ha, we have them now. And the knights charge ahead, leaving their peasant spearmen behind. Oh. And they chase the Mongol army out into the plains for like 10 miles. And then the Mongols just turn around and surround them and murder the entire nobility of Hungary. Yeah. Like, they, bitter, they basically decapitate the kingdom of Hungary. They kill the king, all of the dukes, all of the leading knights in a single battle. And then they roll up and then they just shoot arrows at the peasants until the peasants run away. And then they stab the peasants in the back with lances and kill basically almost everybody. Do they bleed? Yes. Like <laughs> pathetic losers. <laughs> uh, but so, anyway, that, I tell you about that battle in particular. One, because just the Mongols totally wipe the floor with this uh, medieval feudal army. But also... That is the battle that is going to cause the Pope to write a strongly worded letter to Guyuk Khan. He said, Guyuk, I heard you just basically killed every noble in Hungary. Well, guess what? I talked to God, and God doesn't like that very much. And so tomorrow we are going to read that letter, and we are going to read Guyuk's hilarious response to it. And I think it's one of my favorite examples of talking right past each other. Can I take the quiz now? Um, can you take it during mentoring? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let your mentor know, and then uh, we will do that. All right, bye, guys. Bye, YouTube. Can I just... Like